Lawrence, welcome to Real Vision. Oh, thanks for having me on, Ash. This is your first time on the platform. You've been on the podcast before, uh, Ground Floor Consensus, but your first time on the Real Vision platform. Yeah, because people really need to see me for some reason. <laughs> well, they see you enough already. I should say, by the way, too in much. terms of full disclosure here, we've known each other for a very long time. Very, uh, we've very been long. friends for a very long time. Too uh, long. We talk about crypto markets constantly. Uh, in addition Sadly. to- I know, sadly and cynically. Uh, but in addition to that, you're also obviously managing editor of markets at CoinDesk. Global, uh, global Capital Markets. They, they've, they've just, uh, yeah, I have a new title for some reason. This is like promotion inflation. It's exactly like the crypto. Experience. It is. This is this is a Peter Principle in hell. <laughs> and you also host uh, First Mover with Christine Lee and Emily Parker every morning. And I have the first the first mover newsletter, which hopefully everyone signs up for. How many products do you have? I don't know. <laughs> I stopped counting. It's a lot of things. I should also say um, a compliment, which I don't usually give you in person, uh, which is you're one of the smartest people I know in this space. Ugh, uh, and you are incredibly cynical and you have an amazing nose for nonsense, which is something that, as it turns out, comes quite in handy in the crypto space. I think I think that was maybe an insult about my nose, but I'm not quite sure. I didn't catch the entire <laughs> thing, but OK, sure. You know, it's really interesting. You and I actually uh, have, as I said, known each other for years. Uh, we just missed each other at CNBC. I think you arrived just as I was leaving and we worked together uh, at Yahoo Finance uh, for yeah. the 20 minutes or so that I was there. It's 20 minutes more than it deserved. <laughs> Probably um, true. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you saw their valuations when they just got sold to Apollo, right? $4 billion. It was originally bought by, by Verizon for $10 billion. And Verizon over, trade. yeah, Verizon overpaid already, like you know, fifteen x. So, you know, Apollo's only overpaying by seven or eight x. <laughs> yeah. um, I should also <laughs> mention your background on this is obviously uh, you're a chartered financial analyst, uh, and you've sort chartered of chartered financial analyst, charter holder. Because you can't, you have to use the word charter holder after CFA. They, it is for some. For the reason, you can't call yourself a charter financial analyst. It's charter financial analyst, charter holder. You know and nobody I cares think about this. No, nobody does, except when you actually take the exam. It's like literally a question on the exam. Like, I mean, you know, this guy, Joe Schmo, CFA, calls himself a charter financial analyst. Can he do that? The answer is always no. He has to call himself a charter financial analyst, charter holder. I, they give you points for this on the test. They 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 deduct points on it if you fail <laughs> if you make a mistake. That's really what they do. I think that's the prime metaphor for your life. You give no one points. You just deduct them. Deduct everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I you start out from mention, a low number and you just keep going. <laughs> I should also mention uh, that you've traded FX at a hedge fund. That's how you came up in this space, uh, and one of the reasons why I think you have the sharp eye that you do uh, for things that happen in the crypto space. Uh, yeah, sure. Whatever. It All was, right, so you, uh, get, you get this fancy yeah. title now about global markets. Uh, what the hell is going on in these markets? How do you characterize them uh, for people who are perhaps uh, coming to it from the crypto side who don't have your background uh, in capital markets? How do you explain what's happening right now? Oh, oh God. Um, there's a certain degree of, uh, you, you know, you always hear about... F uh what we're showing you here on our YouTube channel is just the tip of the iceberg. No matter where you are in your financial journey, whether you're a beginner just looking to break into the market or a financial professional looking to up your game, Real Vision has something for everyone. Every day our team of expert journalists provides in-depth analysis, written reports, access to live streams, and access to our community, The Exchange, where you can interact with people just like you from all over the world. For just $1, you can unlock all of this and more at realvision.com. Try our essential tier. If you like what you see, it's only 20 bucks a month thereafter. So click on the link in the description, go to realvision.com, and see what you think. We look forward to seeing you there. Oh, oh God. Um, there's a certain degree of, uh, you, you know, you always hear about f uh, hope, fear, and greed. And it, it's, there's so far, it seems to be a lot of 
uh, hope and greed. I think that's like the, the those are the two big things here. Um, it, we kind of forget just how thin the crypto markets are. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking about, oh, wow, you know, uh, Bitcoin is it has a market cap of a trillion dollars. And as Joe Weisenthal at Bloomberg has pointed out, Apple gained a trillion dollars in market cap over the past few months. And it took Bitcoin like 12 something years to get there, which granted it is the fastest anything has ever gotten to, to a trillion dollars. But let's remember that it's still the size, it's still market cap wise, smaller than some, some of the largest companies in the world. Fewer and fewer companies is it smaller than, but it's still relatively small. But still, the rate of progress getting to a trillion dollars, as you say, faster than anything else uh, in the history of the world. And it's done it in a decentralized way without a marketing firm, uh, without a board of directors, without a CEO. It's done it with a lot of, um, you know, we, we talk about the network effect and yeah. there's an aspect of it, but it has had some marketing, right? I mean, not, not organized marketing, but it, it's had, you know, it's the same way like rock and roll. Right, music, punk, whatever it is, um, you know, new wave, which is, you know, it sort of sort of starts out and people talk about it and whatever, and they kind of grow a fan base, and those fans are rapidly loyal to their band, and they heard about it before you did, and uh, they're not into it as much anymore because oh wow, look all these normies who are into it now. It's got it's got a lot of the same dynamics as um as some of these uh, alternative bands that have become popular speaking of uh, alternative bands also ethereum over 3000 just hit over the weekend we're recording here uh on monday may 3rd um but this is a big sort of round number psychological level for ethereum to cross yeah um people like those round numbers it's still about a third the value uh total value of bitcoin um, people are growing more and more. The other thing to remember too, is that Ethereum, Ether, the currency Ether, right? We have to remember there's Ethereum, the, the network, and then Ether, the coin. So Ether is up, uh, it's, it's quadrupled in value since January 1st. Bitcoin has only doubled, if that. Um, and, and there's a lot of uh, hope there with the and a lot of vision about what the future will be like uh, because of some of the changes happening within the uh, Ethereum uh, network. So people are uh, looking at that as a potential, uh, the future of crypto, which, yeah. you know, I think that's healthy. It is not just tied to Bitcoin. Because yeah. But listen, look, only doubled since January. Here we are in May. Uh, that's an extraordinary trajectory and something that we don't yeah. see uh, for example, in large cap U.S. equities, no, you know, you know, you don't see it. It's still growing. I mean, something that doubles, anything that doubles over a course of a few months is uh, exciting. It says that there's a lot of room on the upside potentially to go, um, and that there's still some amount of excitement in the in the project. But uh, part of it to remember is that it is still, like I said, a thin market. You know, this isn't. This isn't the most, it's not, it's not trading in yen. It's not trading in bonds. It's not trading in whatever it is. Uh, there are a lot of markets that are much bigger than this. And it's something that I think a lot of people forget. And by a lot of people, I mean, people who are buying into this whole narrative of uh, these companies that put it on their balance sheet and they go, oh, it's, they're doing it for liquidity purposes. Really? Uh, yeah, okay, great. So guess what? If Elon Musk decides to sell the $1 billion worth of Bitcoin he has on his books and decides to throw it into the market all at once, right? It's going to be a problem. It's going to be a huge problem for Bitcoin because there aren't enough buyers for that $1 billion all at once, right? It'll blow through a lot of orders and it will trigger a lot of liquidations. Um, it, you know, because let's not forget that a lot of the Bitcoin market is leveraged. So this idea that it's liquidity, you're buying into, you know, they're, they're, they're putting their money in a liquid asset. I mean, come on, people, really? Like, seriously? No, they want to put in a liquid asset, they put it in treasuries. 
Yeah. That's a liquid asset. You throw, you throw, you sell a trillion dollars in treasuries. It's not going to be great for for the rates for a short amount of time, but it's a short amount of time. Yeah, there are other people buying on the other side. Bitcoin's a different story. Yeah, and what we're talking about here is the price impact uh, when you have these large uh, scale trades that go through. Obviously, the treasury markets deep, massively liquid, trade at thin spreads. I don't know that we've had any real tests uh, at depths. Uh, with that kind of impact. You talk about companies. Uh, I know that there is uh, another company, a uh, publicly traded company uh, here in the US that owns Bitcoin that you've also been talking about recently. Uh, yeah, MicroStrategy. Um, you know, they've become a, um, you know, it was a, you know, Michael Saylor, I actually like, I, I, we interviewed him. I actually enjoyed talking to him. Uh, people think like, oh, he owned you. I, no, you have to ask tough questions. You know, there's, there's this kind of mentality in, in uh, crypto that you can't question people for going long crypto. You can't question people for buying Bitcoin. How dare you question them? Really? That's, that, that's what we've become? Like, <laughs> you know, like you can't ask somebody, gee, you know, you have no liabilities on your on your balance sheet that are denominated in Bitcoin. So why are you putting your assets in it? Is that is that, you know, does that really work out? Why are you and his argument is why well, I can borrow at 0% and buy Bitcoin at 0% and it's an and it's an appreciating asset. It's appreciating until it's not appreciating anymore. Then you've now taken out a lot of leverage and you've leveraged your balance sheet. Um to buy something that's going down. Now he has a long-term view of it, but okay. They, the company has a, a product, it has its own, you know, there's a consulting firm, whatever it is. And they, they've done quite well. They've done their, their uh, you know, a few years making the same amount of money, market cap's about a billion dollars and change. And then they bought up all this Bitcoin and the price of the stock shot through the roof. But one of the things it did was it created a massive premium to the company. So if you if you subtracted the debt, if you subtracted the um, the the company itself, the market valuation before it started buying Bitcoin, and then you just look at solely the value of the Bitcoin as a as a percentage of its market cap, or if you just attributed everything else to the value of it, of uh, the value of its market cap to that Bitcoin, it's the equivalent of doubling your um, price for Bitcoin to get into Bitcoin. And the argument is, well, gee, you know, institutions have nowhere else to play the Bitcoin market. Yeah, you know what? There, guess that's changing soon, right? Canada has ETFs now, Bitcoin ETFs. CME has ET has uh, Bitcoin futures. Um, you ha you have other play backed lets people buy Bitcoin futures, lets institutions potentially buy Bitcoin futures, and then it ultimately with Gary Gensler running the SEC now, Gary Gensler uh, taught crypto at at MIT, right? So it's not like he's he's an enemy of of crypto, is an enemy of of big on the contrary. So the odds are pretty pretty good that we'd see an ETF, a Bitcoin ETF at least. Uh, over the next few months, then what's the value of that premium? You know, you're betting that that the company that went out and leveraged itself to buy Bitcoin has another trick up its sleeve at that point. Yeah, and it's not a one trick pony. But you know, you 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 mentioned this, you mentioned this, and then people on Twitter or on YouTube, whatever it is, oh, how dare you know, have fun staying poor. Oh. Okay, well, that's your answer. You know, there, there, there was a great thing because Charlie Munger made a comment about Bitcoin, not liking Bitcoin. Yeah. And I think Zero Hedge had, had the best tweet, have fun staying a billionaire. <laughs> you know, but like, think about the mentality of people <laughs> that they are freaked out that a guy who's 90 something years old, who has as much money, right, in wealth, right? He and Warren Buffett, those two guys together, Right, you think about like Mansa Musa, right, going through, going through on his way to to Mecca, destroying the gold market because he had so much gold that he was spending. Okay, that that 
that kind of wealth, right? That's what Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have together. And a bunch of Bitcoiners sitting at home, you know, they, they've made like, you know, 4X, 5X on their money. Congrats. Great for you. Great. You were buying. And now you're telling Charlie Munger what to do. The arrogance. There's a word, chutzpah, I think is the proper term for this. <laughs> All right, so so you, you, no, but, no, but if like, if you have a legitimate argument with them and say, look, I, you know, I disagree that there are things going on here, but it's like, eh, you don't know anything. Eh. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Let me ask you this, Lawrence. What? what do you think of when you think about these markets in the broadest sense, when you think about cryptocurrency, what do you think the use case is? How do you think about the long-term value proposition for this market that you cover obsessively. Who cares? Who cares what I think? No, I'm serious. Like, who cares what I think? I don't care what I think when it comes to crypto. That's why I'm asking the questions and not answering them. <laughs> it's a weird, this is, I mean, even this is kind of weird, right? Like you're asking me, somebody whose job it is to ask questions, you're asking me questions. I don't have answers. What the hell do I know? Okay, so how do you think about these markets then? How do you think about the way they trade? Obviously, you're being a bit falsely humble here. You do understand these markets. You understand markets in general. You have a background, years trading FX. How do you think about the price action? How do you think about the market structure? How do you think totally about stupid. what we see day to day? Totally stupid. Completely stupid. I, you know, the other day there was this, this is a couple of weekends ago, some moron put in an order. And like, you know, this is what happens when people are kind of new to markets and just have no common, not even common sense, they have no market sense. It's not common sense. Common sense is uh, everyday person, right? And most people every day, I mean, you see what goes on on Robinhood, they have no clue what they're doing. Um, you know, this is, seriously, it's like Robinhood is like, it's like handing out pistols to toddlers. Like, what are you doing here? Most of these people should not be touching anything. You know, just put it in a 401k, like, you know, buy an ETF or whatever, and just sit back and leave it alone. You should not be trading, you know, your grandma's, you know, inheritance or whatever it is she gave you. You know, you know that, that's really have fun staying poor because that's really what that's ultimately going to lead to. Uh, but anyway, so somebody put in this large sell, sell order in Bitcoin. During the weekend. And during the weekend, no like on a Saturday. Like what? What what do you think is going on? People go home. They don't have time for this. They don't have time to sit there and like, you know, there are the obsessive, whatever, but you know, you, they forget this is a thin market. You don't put a you don't put a large sell order on a Saturday. Why? Why? And it shot the price down like several thousand dollars. And then it bounced back up Monday morning when Asia came in. They're like, what, what the hell? What discount? I'll buy some of this. But who was the idiot that sold it on Saturday? Which is why this goes, but this goes back to this whole discussion that we're having about liquidity, right? About, you know, micro strategies, Tesla, whatever. Tesla can do it because it's a joke for Tesla, right? It's a small fraction of their assets but they're not loading up their balance sheet the way MicroStrategy is. And then yeah. all of a sudden, you know, like some, some goofus at, at, a, you know, at some fund has a fat finger mistake or forgets to, to tell his bot to not sell on Saturday or whatever it is. And the price of whatever the hell you're owning goes down 15%. And then when you really need it as an emergency use of cash for whatever reason, you know, I don't know what they would actually use cash for, to be honest. Um, but okay, like they need it and they have to, they have to sell some. Well, you're selling, <laughs> you're selling at the bottom, you moron. You know, uh, Lawrence, our Roger Hurst right here, uh, Real Vision once referred to as a proper markets man, which I think is his highest compliment. As you look at these markets as a proper markets man, and you see this idiocy, I mean, the flip side of that trade is that it's opportunity for whoever's trading yeah. against you. For now. For now. I mean, like, but again, you're taking a bet on a very long term propo proposal as to what this thing will really be like. 
right? And you're taking a bet that Bitcoin's going to potentially win out against everything, or at least win out over the next few months, if not years, right? And I think you know what we're seeing with Doge is a prime example of what can possibly go wrong. I think Doge is the you know right now if I'm a Bitcoiner like a like a maxi, right? And I'm looking at this deep down inside, you should be a little worried about Doge. Not because it's that great. It's actually not that great. But you listen to Bitcoin Maxis talk about Doge. They talk about Doge the way other people talked about Bitcoin Maxis and Bitcoin in general. It's the same, it's the same thing. It's like, oh, you know, this is this is BS. It's not real. It's just a bunch of code. Anybody could blow it up. You know, like, and, and then the maxis are all like, oh, you know, you can have unlimited amount of doge. Maybe that's the selling point. Maybe it's the fact that it can grow with an economy as opposed to the horrifying world that would exist if Bitcoin were the only currency left. Yeah. Right. And so if we got if we abandon all fiat tomorrow and left it with Bitcoin, which fewer and fewer maxis are about. But, you know, that that's what we're seeing. Like there's still that mentality that the world should convert to Bitcoin. This would be a terrible, terrible world. There'd be no growth at all. Ask Nixon how that. Ask Nixon how it how it went when when you tried to peg the dollar to gold. How did that go for him? <laughs> so, give a little bit of context, Lawrence, for people who don't know the story about Nixon uh, taking the U.S. off the gold standard, and probably who uh, may not uh, understand the level. Uh, of detail that you do about the way uh, Bitcoin's inflation schedule is structured. Bitcoin, the whole thing with Bitcoin is this, is that there's a limit of 21 million total uh, Bitcoin will be mined, right? Of which we're at like 18 and change right now, million. So we're almost done. The remaining three and whatever, uh, it'll take, I don't know, it's like a hundred years, some, something stupid like that um, before we get to the end. Right. You're talking about the progressive halvenings here so that yeah. you basically yeah. get down to a zero growth rate. Well, halvin, ha halvenings or halvings. We, we, I honestly don't, nobody, you know, nomenclature wise, um, nobody, nobody has a, it hasn't been, it hasn't been settled yet. We're, we're waiting for the AP to come out with their, with their <laughs> standard. Here. I think of halvening as like vaguely ironic, which is why I say it, particularly with you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, um, yeah, so getting back to this is uh, like, you think about what that means, right? If you have all this happening, and then first of all, you have all the whales that control a uh, huge proportion of Bitcoin. You have no growth in the amount of Bitcoin that, that is out there. So perpetually prices will fall, right? It's inherently deflationary. Assuming everything grows, assuming the economy grows. Well, what incentive do people have to spend their Bitcoin if the value of that Bitcoin goes up all the time? What would be the reason you would spend it? Well, they have a negative incentive, and this is the challenge with the store of value function almost being diametrically opposed uh, to the uh, mechanism of exchange function. So let's explain that in simple English, because I think that, that we really have to think about what it would mean. All right. I'm sitting on, let's say, I don't know, 100 Bitcoin. Let's say I'm sitting on 100 Bitcoin. I'm not actually, so please don't, you know, don't hold me hostage. It's not happening. <laughs> You're honestly going to get zero Bitcoin. I own nothing. All right. Um, but let's say I'm sitting on 100 Bitcoin. And, and if I were sitting on 100 Bitcoin, believe me, I wouldn't be doing this, this uh, anything. I wouldn't be doing any interviews. You wouldn't even know me. I'd be, I'd be hiding somewhere, right? Um, so I have 100 Bitcoin and I have a choice, right? I could spend it all now. I could spend some of it now. Or I could just wait. Wait for the value of Bitcoin to go up next year and buy whatever it is, right? Now, if everybody in the world all of a sudden converts to Bitcoin, first of all, you're going to have a serious, serious problem with the haves and have-nots, right? 20% or whatever it is that, go, that belongs to Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, corpse, right? That's not spent, right? Dead people can't spend Bitcoin. Then, uh, it, it, by the way, people, Satoshi is no longer with us. So listen, you know, I'm sorry, Craig Wright. 
maybe you are, but whatever. <laughs> um, but like you have the rest of these people with a lot of Bitcoin who are walking around and, you know, they're the neck beards who were mining it back in 2009 or whatever. And, you know, they got a whole bunch and um, like they have no incentive to, to spend it. So people, who, if the world were to convert tomorrow to Bitcoin, right? So now what happens to those people who have no internet access, who have no access to their cell phones, who have no access to anything, right? So they're stuck with like five or six Satoshi. Satoshi is the smallest unit of uh, Bitcoin, right? It's a couple of cents there. 100, 100, yeah. 100 million. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying a few. Yeah, exactly. It's like it's nothing, nothing. And you have this world where nobody's spending anything, nobody's growing anything, right? Why, why would you spend anything? So you have a complete collapse of the world economy, at which point we're all like, you know, like ha most of the world's gonna be living back in caves. And a few, you know, a few geeks will be uh, doing whatever it is they do. I have no idea. Not dating, that's for sure. <laughs> cause, cause that would cost money for them. Send what, I gotta angry, buy dinner? Send the angry tweets to Lawrence and not to me, but I have to say it does, it puts you in this position that is the world that you're describing, this almost dystopian uh, existence uh, is very similar to uh, what Hyman Minsky uh, discussed in terms of debt deflation. You have the value uh, of what is owed continuing to rise in real terms, which puts downward pressure on growth and economic activity. Yeah, yeah, and then some. I mean, this is, this is, and it's even worse because you're also concentrating the wealth, right? This is like, and, and by the way, because this is such a horrible vision in the future, it's, it's probably going to happen at, on some scale. Lawrence, but do you see any potential good that can no. come from a world with Bitcoin? Oh, um, <laughs> I don't, you look. When you read the white paper, it's beautiful, right? It's so, so it's really elegant. Like that's the word that everyone uses to describe it. It's elegant. Um, and it solves a lot of problems, a lot of interesting things going on there, right? What problems does of, it the, solve in your view? Oh, it solves some of the, you know, like I think the, the idea of like trustless, you know, going into transactions in, in a trustless basis, um, it, it it solves that. But we should um, say, in fairness to you, you don't much like banks either. I don't like anybody. But um, no, I, look, I think, you know, banks are just stupid operations, but they've done quite well for themselves. So um, most of the time they, they, you know, they, they often, they're successful despite themselves. So, um, you know, Good job, boys. Keep going. And I do mean boys because very few women get to run these things. Um, although that's changing. But um, much for the better in, in that regard that there's yeah. progress made. Yeah, not now people can despise them too. I mean, I guess. That's where that's where that's where all the protest sides are going, right? <laughs> um but the the thing is that it's like there, so there's some aspects to it that are that are wonderful, but um, you know it's awful lot of energy, it's awful lot of work, it's awful lot of um, you know a lot of it's fairly slow to get things done in terms of transaction processing speed. So, yeah, yeah, very slow, yeah. and uh, you know I think that wasn't you know. Look, I, I think it, it's far more successful than it was expected to be. You know, when it first started, it seemed to make sense. Everything worked out great. But the fact that it's far more successful than it was supposed to be, does that not in some way uh, presuppose or imply uh, that there is some value here uh, that really looks material, that really looks substantial? Look, when you talk to Bitcoiners, uh, the case is pretty clear. They see this as a truly decentralized, stateless form of money. Uh, that has the power to massively reduce friction, to 
re, uh, basically to immunize or indemnify individuals uh, against confiscatory tax regimes, against oppressive governments. Uh, the use cases that they see for this, uh, effectively, software eating money uh, is virtually limitless. Yeah, everyone everyone loves that stuff until they you know until they want something from the government. You know, they you need a court system at some point. Explain a little bit by what you mean there. Well, it's going to be hard to pay for, you know, if you're not paying taxes and, you know, you're, you're avoiding all this stuff. Look, I, I don't like taxes. I don't like the income tax. I think it's a, a, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest mistakes in the constitution. It's, um, it's terrible. It's uh, also something that in the 21st century is becoming less and less relevant to what, what was the intention. The intention was to, uh, I mean, there were, Bunch of terrible intentions, to be honest, with with implementing the income tax. Right, it came at a time when the United States was all about. Um, it the, actually the U.S. was pretty radical about a hundred years ago. A lot of a lot of the philosophy, like you look at the some of the stuff there. You know, you, Eugene V. Debs getting a, a sizable portion of, of the uh, of the election uh, when, when he would run, and it's. You know the the mentality of what the country was about back a uh, hundred years ago, when or more than a hundred years ago, uh, when it, it implemented the income tax was we're going to stick it to the rich because there was this large wealth discrepancy. Um, there, there was also a failure on, on the part of state governments. State governments were a cesspool. Um, it's why they, they also got rid of this whole thing of having the Senate, uh, ha having state assemblies, uh, state legislatures and governors choosing the, the Senate because because this, they would have situations where like no one could agree. There'd be decades with no one to just agree on like who their senator should be. So as a man who spent many years in New Jersey politics. Yeah, I, I, if there's somebody who knows something about cesspools of, of politics, it's somebody who's who's gone through the, the ringer in Jersey. All right, Lawrence, let me play the counter case here. We do not live in Gene Debs's world. We do not live in the world of the Wobblies. Uh, we live in a world uh, where the ascendancy of capital uh, over labor for most of our lifetime uh, has been pretty clear. So getting back to this whole thing, um, what I'm getting at is this, is that so now we're, we've come up with ways to uh, get around the income tax as best as we can, right? So there are different ways that have been that have been done over the years. Apple opening up in Ireland, for instance, you know, whatever it is that you know they they try to find ways to get around income tax, right? They, I mean, think if you think about what an income tax is, it's taxing production, it's taxing productivity, it's not taxing wealth. Taxing wealth is a totally different animal, which states can do, right, when they tax land, when they do property taxes. And inheritance. That's, that's a, an inheritance, yeah, well, that's, a, that's another issue. It's a, that's in many ways a form of double taxation. I don't want to get into that. But we, you know, when you talk about, oh, well, isn't it great this thing gets around income tax? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, I hate income taxes probably more than the average person, but we are now, we've now created a whole system of courts and system of everything. And courts, by the way, that's ultimately really what governments, that's like the bottom line of what it's there for, right? Is to, is to deal with property issues. Like yeah. when you go back in time and you're like, okay, why do we need a court system? We need a court system because we have property issues. Never mind the moral issues of whatever, um, you know, buying you know, whatever it is on Sunday, which I apparently can't do in Bergen County. Um, so we have, we have blue laws here. I can't use capitalism. I can't go to a store to buy a tie on Sunday. Like, a, and, and like, you know, I'll give an example. Well, there you go. This makes you a Bitcoin or libertarian. Yeah, but may, but my my thinking is that maybe the structure isn't Bitcoin. Maybe it's something else. We have to kind of think of something that, you know, we also have to consider like what does Bitcoin, you know, like is Bitcoin the only thing out there? 
Well, that's I don't an want a world question. where there's just I, I don't want a world where there's just one currency. Well, and that precisely to that point, the answer to that is no. Obviously, we have uh, whatever the number is, some number of thousands uh, of coins right now. Uh, so we've already established that you hate everything. It's not specific to cryptocurrency. So how do you then think about the price action? How do you then think about these markets uh, as someone who comes to this from the perspective with the lens uh, of a markets editor? How do you think about the price action? What do you mean? I, I, I don't understand like... Well, you watch these the markets market. every day. You've yeah. seen this extraordinary run up. Yeah. Uh, now at 57,000, as we have this conversation here on, on uh, Bitcoin, uh, almost 3,200 on Ethereum, you look at these markets, you see the amount uh, of wealth creation that has happened. How do you think okay. about that? How do you think about the trajectory of those markets? How do you assess what the potential forward direction of them is? Look, part of it is the insane spending by the federal government um, in the past few months over uh, fiscal stimulus, right? To get us out of the pandemic when the, we already have signs that that's already coming to an end in terms of uh, economic stimulus. Try booking a flight, see how that goes for you. Um, restaurants, uh, you know, I walk in and I see restaurants are packed indoors in places like New Jersey right across the river from New York, which uh, under the stewardship of Andrew Cuomo had one of the most horrifying amounts of deaths seen uh, because of COVID. Yeah. Because of, because of uh, terrible mistakes uh, that he made. It probably, uh, you know, wasn't in bad faith, but then to cover it up the way he did, um, you know, like, come on. Uh, but we, you know, we have a, an economy that's that's rebounding very fast. And we have a government that has taken, look, the, part of it is social media. You know, you want to get back to this whole idea of, of a network effect and things like that. New, the United States has become pretty dumb when it comes to uh, its policy, because for the most part, it's now a lot of it is dictated by a few loudmouths on Twitter. Um, and I'm not just talking about the previous administration. I'm talking about just, you know, this is left and right. It's a bunch of crazy people. And we're seeing this now become policy. Now's our chance to restructure the United States. By what? By putting our children and grandchildren in a huge amount of debt. That there's no way they're going to repay or could repay. Um, on a level not seen ever. You know, we're talking about wartime footing. And the whole reason this is happening is because, first of all, we have the opposition party is too hung up on a social agenda. It's a ridiculous, again, it's focusing on Twitter, it's focusing on memes, it's focusing on, you know, Dr. Seuss. Lawrence, I have to say, this secular setup sounds very bullish in your view, based on the context that you've just created for the valuation of Bitcoin. And other things, and Doge, and Ether, and Algorand, or whatever, you know, let's keep the, you know, keep it going. Like, why stop there? Well, do keep it going. Talk about your view of the overall crypto complex uh, and what you think this means uh, more broadly. I think you'll just have specializations Different currencies have specializations. Uh, Bitcoin is not going to be the end all and be all of the future. Now, right? that itself is obviously a very controversial proposition, uh, particularly among the Bitcoin maximalist community or Bitcoiners, as they prefer to be called. Sure. And and dollar maximizes, dollar maxis, whatever the hell you want to call them, uh, had probably the same view of Bitcoin, too. If you, if, you know, then if, if your view of Bitcoin is that that's the end of the road for crypto, then you didn't really have a view of crypto. You just are a jerk because you, your whole thing is like, I just want to be the cool guy. I want to be into that cool band that was playing, that wasn't, was playing like on college radio once they had, they played one single 
And then I saw them open up for somebody else who was only had like two singles on that college radio station. And now all of a sudden it gets picked up by top 40 and everyone's wearing their t-shirt. And I'm like, oh, wow. What a bunch, oh God, sellouts. I can't stand them. You know, so you're all, you know, like you're upset that, that other people are adopting crypto. And it's right, not- I get, I get this argument. The guy who uh, used to hang out with uh, Bono when he used to have to buy him uh, pints of Guinness at a pub uh, in uh, in Ireland uh, never likes the idea that he sold out an arena. But look, the Bitcoiners, uh, let me make the argument because it's an important one. They would say, look, Bitcoin is not a static entity. Bitcoin Core is in continual development, continual improvement. And yeah, so in are their view, and in their view, just in addition to that, uh, they believe uh, that the layer two, three, and four solutions that are going to come on top of the protocol. And a metaphor for this might be TCP IP. Obviously, we're having a conversation right now over Zoom. Uh, this is not native functionality that's built into TCP IP. You have a protocol stack, you have layers that go on top of it. So you have the potential, potential with Bitcoin to extend that functionality in additional layer solutions that get built upon it. In their view, in the Bitcoiner view, uh, we're still incredibly early in this space. And the potential to continue to extend uh, Bitcoin to do some of the things, for example, that Ethereum is doing or other smart contract platforms uh, as these additional layers get added on is very great in their view. Okay. I mean, like, look, where were we 12 years ago? Where were we 12 years ago? There was no Bitcoin. So... What's to say that there is not some somebody right now coming up with something better? Well, the argument is the counter case, is, which is, you know, of course, uh, is that uh, money does not serve uh, the same type of role uh, as other things in the economy. It effectively becomes a standards war. Uh, and once there's an established base, once you get to a point where there is like the uh, you know, some one trillion plus dollars in market capitalization, uh, it wins out. For example, one doesn't, uh, you know, come up with a uh, with script uh, to substitute for U.S. dollars because we know that U.S. dollars is the de facto standard. So, in the view uh, of the Bitcoin community, what matters about Bitcoin is it's reached a kind of critical mass. Uh, it's established not just a valuation, no, but also no, an asset allocation within the no. space that people are exposed to it. Nope, hasn't reached the critical mass yet. Hasn't reached know? a critical mass yet. How do you Hasn't know? reached it because when was the last time you went you went to a store to buy coffee with Bitcoin as per the the white paper? Well, never. But they would say okay. that's a, that the additional layers to extend the functionality, and I'm just making the case uh, the additional layers to extend the functionality. How many uh, people for the bought Betamax? Exchange. How many people bought Betamax machines back way back when? Compared to how many people are using Bitcoin for their daily transactions, not trading. But right. every day, whatever it is they do. Well, it's not established as a medium of exchange. Uh, we know that there are obviously things that are being built right now, things like Strike, the Lightning Network, that can extend the functionality in that direction. Uh, but for people who are not just trading, and I would argue that there's a third case, uh, medium of exchange, uh, the trading functionality, obviously, which is a, just a, a capital markets play, like play, uh, where you're, you're trying to capture alpha, uh, but also the idea that there is a store of value function. There are a lot of people who own Bitcoin, uh, and what they do with it is they continue to hold it uh, as it continues to go up in value. Yeah, and in that sense, some do. it begins to look like a digital gold type play. Nah, I, look, yeah. At the end of the day, when you really need, when, when look, um, the hard, hard assets at the end of the day, you know, I, and I, I never liked the comparison with gold. I understand the digital gold argument up to a point. Uh, the whole point of gold is it's in many ways a useful vehicle to do whatever it is you need to do, right? When uh, my family was trying to get out of Egypt, my, my, I had an, an uncle who um, was caught smuggling gold out and he was a young kid. He was, he was, he was uh, early teens and he was beaten and tortured and put in prison. Um, it, 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 it's hard, right? Um, this is the thing. You had gold because the gold ultimately 
once he got out, it wasn't just to hold gold. It was to use that gold to do something. It was a vehicle, right? It's people who buy Bitcoin to get out of a country, like let's use the refugee example, right? They buy Bitcoin to get out of wherever it is in a, in a clean way. They have to remember 12 words. Um, and that's These are enough. the seed phrases, the ability to basically memorize a seed phrase and to come back to your private key. Right. And you can remember those 12 words and the millions of dollars that you needed to smuggle out. Once you get out of your country, wherever, whatever country it is, you know, you can go to an internet cafe and all of a sudden now you have your money back. Right. Right. It's a pretty it powerful hard case, Lawrence. It is a powerful case. But it's not the, you know, like the, the actual times that happens is fairly rare. And it doesn't necessarily need to be Bitcoin anyway. Yeah. There are, there is a potential that other things might happen. And I think the maxis also had, you know, they, so the way to, to approach it is sort of like, it's interesting. And right now it's got the best narrative. It has a great narrative, but we shouldn't be blind to the fact that there are better narratives that could be told out there for other things. Talking of narratives, Lawrence, one of the other things that winds you up in this space that I think you've been very eloquent about and one of the early people uh, to thinking about critically, analytically, looking at data and understanding the narrative that it suggests is Tether. Yeah. What about it? <laughs> okay, so a story comes out over the weekend uh, that uh, Bloomberg story about Tether, uh, that Tether now holds in market capitalization uh, more in aggregate than I think all but 44 of the largest banks in the Allegedly. United States. Allegedly. Try getting, try getting your money out. <laughs> well, tell this story, Lawrence, what you mean by that. No, so far, like, seriously, I, do you know anybody who's been able to get their money out of Tether? Like who's been able to go up to Tether and be like, I need to redeem, you know, $10 million in Tether for US dollars. Like straight up US dollars. Give me back US dollars. Not USDT Tether tokens, not USDC. I'm not going to trade it on some exchange. I want the hard dollars to come back. Well, you know, for the most part, those redemptions don't occur because people are using it uh, as almost a, a kind of digital dollar. So where's the money? Level. Well, you tell me. What's your analysis tell you about that? Well, we, you know, every day it's a different story, isn't it? Right. For a long time, they said we have the money. We have there is a one-to-one -one backing. Okay. How? What happened between April of 2017 and whatever when they finally started getting banking? So April 2017. This is the importance of that date. Is this? is back in April of 2017, Tether lost its uh, course, it, it could no longer bank with uh, its banks in Taiwan that were that had the correspondence. Uh, it was, a, there were correspondence banks with uh, Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo was like, what? You guys are doing what? With who? What? Crypto? No, we're not having anything to do with this. This is insane. And all of a sudden they lost their banking. Yet the amount of Tether that was issued kept going up. How? Where did they, when you put in money, where did it go? And the, the settlement that they had with the New York Attorney General recently over some shenanigans that were happening. This was widely regarded, by the way, as a bullish signal uh, for the future of Tether. What? The but settlement the they reached with the NYAG. Yeah, because it was it was in many ways uh, saying, all right, well, everything's fine now. They'll report their their data. Um, sure. Well, that was the perception, certainly. Yeah. But let's go back to how all those. Th so the bottom line is the, the real question is this. And this is this is forever going to be the question that floats. Until you can actually get somebody from Tether to admit or to talk about this. You know, I'd like Ash, I mean, I don't know. You've you've talked to them, right? I have not. You haven't? Oh, okay. <laughs> I try to bring him on the show. Ask him. He's not doing my show. <laughs> 
But the, the question is this, did they issue the Tether first by Bitcoin and then when they needed to sell that Bitcoin for dollars to show that those dollars existed. So explain what you mean by that, because this is okay. critical. And I know you're just asking it as a question and not asserting uh, that it happened. But what yeah, is that question It's an important asking? question to ask. Yeah, it's what an is that question, question to ask? And explain okay. the implications for people who may not be following this that closely. Okay. So from April 2017 on to, I, I forget, it was several months later, if not further, uh, when they finally got a bank that would be willing to deal with them. And even then, there were some questions about it. Ultimately, uh, they ended up going from bank to bank, thrown around. And then at one point, they were dealing with this uh, company that, uh, you know, crypto, I forgot what it was, um, CC something. Um, and they used a guy named Reggie Fowler, uh, who owned a piece of the Minnesota Vikings. And... Um, he was setting up an accounts at HSBC saying that they were for his real estate practice, right? He was a real estate investor. Um, and, you know, it turned out that's not quite what was going on. But in the meantime, they're processing things such as Tether, uh, Tether's dollar transactions. But getting back to 2017 and why that's important is this. So you had a steady issuance of Tether throughout all of a sudden, right after they lost their banking. And, the and you can see this is how... with on-chain data. Correct. You could see it, you go, you know, for, for, for those who are maybe not, you know, go back, go to CoinMarketCap or uh, better yet, go to CoinDesk. We have uh, old, old charts of, uh, you know, maybe you can go through, uh, look, at, look at the market cap of Tether starting in April, 2017, when it was like, uh, like 50 million. And it had of course, a steady- because it's pegged, and because it's pegged to the dollar- uh, at You would assume there are 50 million in deposits. You would right. assume. Yeah, so you can basically see the growth of issuance because you can see the growth of market cap and the two yeah. are basically tied at one to one uh, because Tether trades at or near uh, $1. Yeah, so you would assume Dollars going in, market cap goes up because somebody puts in a dollar and they get back a tether. But the thing is, you put in a dollar, where did it go? If, if they couldn't put, hold those dollars anywhere, now, potentially we don't know about, or, you know, I don't know, like, you know, guys, we, we don't know because they're not entirely open about it. Uh, and that actually is one of the reasons why they're so successful. I'll get to that in a second. But the one of the potential argument, one of the arguments that's been made is that the tether never, the dollars never actually came in. There were no dollars. That they just, you know, much like the Fed, let the money printer go brr, and they started printing, issuing tether with no assets backing it and that they use those tether to buy bitcoin through other entities and then when time came that they needed to show on their books x amount of dollars they merely sold some bitcoin and were able to show that those dollars once they start getting uh once they start getting dollar accounts that's that's been the the big accusation and rumor floating around the market. Never been proven to be clear. Uh, never been proven, is... never been proven, never been disproven because you can't get a, you can't get a damn, uh, any data out of them. And that, and one of the things that happened too in this process in April, starting April, 2017, starting through all this is that the price of Bitcoin shot through the moon. It peaked shortly after the CFTC raided their offices at New York and, and uh, you know, went in and got some documentation or something, uh, you know. Um, now, it's obviously, Bitcoin has obviously far eclipsed uh, those highs uh, here. But if the, it, Tether, you see, the thing is this, Tether is the, um, is the main currency. When you trade dollars against Bitcoin, in, in particularly in Asia, Asia, um, the, the onboard way to do the way to get onboarded in Asia in, in a lot of cases is through Tether. Right. Right. You can't, you can't, you have to find a way to go offshore to trade your, your, let's say your yuan for, 
for tether right and then once you have once you have tether you can start trading bitcoin and what do the metrics suggest to you lawrence about the scale uh, of tether in the bitcoin market it's it's a huge percent i think it was like more than half half sometimes it was like 75 percent at some point and ultimately years go down and um it turns out that they started to say well we only have about 73 percent or 71 i don't remember 70 something percent of doll uh, of tether right is ba backed by dollars and the rest are all ious and things like that they don't say to whom or you know, the, you know, they said uh, other other forms of assets to cover the difference. Now, IOUs to, you know, to related entities and people. Yeah. Like, you know, great. You know, you know. Lawrence, finally, talking of Asia, uh, we didn't mention yet Binance. I know you recently interviewed Brian Brooks. Yeah. What are your thoughts about what's happening at Binance right now? Uh, not much thoughts. I just, I just wish they would just answer where the hell they are. What is that I mean, question and what's its significance for people who don't follow that story? Um, you know, the, the real question is knowing where a company is really located helps in terms of who can ultimately make life miserable for whom, right? Hmm. Like if you have uh, dollars if you have if you have your your accounts let's say uh, le all right let's let's do coinbase right coinbase doesn't actually have an office you know they 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 went all remote all virtual whatever it is whatever they call it um i mean but they but, have an office they have a us domiciled address that they're doing business yeah they're, they're based out of delaware but actually when you look at their headquarters there's no headquarters on, on their s1 uh when they went public um it, it specifically says no you know, no address, but at the very least they're using Amazon, uh, they're using AWS. It's also Amazon. run by US persons. Run by US persons, yeah. But when you, when it comes to uh, Binance and, you know, there's some other uh, entities, but Binance being the biggest, right? Um, they were based out of China. They had some problems with Chinese government. They went to Malta, allegedly. And they claimed they were a Maltese company until the Ministry of Finance in Malta was like, St please stop calling them a Maltese company. They're not, they're not based here. So Brian Brooks was a regular, I like Brian Brooks. I think he's, he's a very, um, he, you know, I think he's really, uh, really articulates um, many of the great things about crypto. And there are great things, believe it or not. I do think there are great things, Ash, about crypto. He also has an impressive background. He served as yeah. the acting comptroller of the currency here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and he was a legal counsel at Coinbase. So he's now the, uh, the uh, CEO at, at Binance US. And the question is, where are the servers located? Where are the, um, are there copies of those servers elsewhere? Are there copies of the databases elsewhere? You'd want to know this kind of stuff just because you want to know if another country has a potential of imprisoning uh, people with influence in uh, in the company in exchange for data. Uh, Lawrence, for those who aren't following the story, what's the significance of this? Why does it matter? All right. So several months ago, back if you want to look at the uh, run up in bitcoin that happened in october started in october you had an exchange in china okx where a senior member of the company who may or may not have had access to um the um the keys for their bitcoin hoard may or may not have been i don't know it had an issue let's just say what, what does that mean? By uh, with the, way? the authorities, may or may not have been picked up. Who knows, right? We don't know. We, nobody knows the real story. The speculation um, is that he he may have been arrested. Is that right? That's what the speculation. Sure, is. sure. Um, 
Not and, asserting that it happened, but that was the speculation. Yeah. So for quite some time, people couldn't get their money out. They couldn't, they couldn't get they couldn't get anything transferred out. So they were able to trade on the exchange and trade it up. Right. And the thing was they were all buying Bitcoin to um, so that once they were able to get their funds out of the exchange, they could just go elsewhere. And for a while you did see that happen. Once it went up, once it's like short the day after Thanksgiving, they allowed uh, US Thanksgiving, not Canadian Thanksgiving. Let's let's yes, you know, so this is well over a month. Um, they were able to get their Bitcoin and other assets out of the exchange uh, and go elsewhere. In the meantime, the price went up and up and up and up. And the point is that the, the reason that this executive was picked up had to do with they're trying to fight money laundering in China, um, which you can imagine is somewhat of a big problem when you have a uh, one party system. Um, you know, trying to control everything, much like New York State, but much worse. Um, and then you had, um, so the question in all this is who ultimately controls the data of what goes on in the exchange? So who owns Binance and who controls Binance is of major importance for Binance US, for people who trade on it. And the question of where are they located is important. Uh, Binance was based in China, um, or was at least legally then based in Malta, after it ran into a foul of some authorities in China. We don't know exactly the whole story. You know, who knows? Uh, but when they were based, they allegedly opened up in Malta and then people start referring to them as a Malta-based company until the uh, Ministry of, I think it was Ministry of Finance in Malta was like, nah, these guys, no, we don't know who these guys are. Stop it. Stop saying they're from Malta. They're not, they're not in Malta. Robert Palmer was from Malta. Binance not. Is that true? Uh, Robert Palmer was born, born in Malta. I had no idea. Yeah. Some guys have all the luck. Really? Um, yeah, you really have to know, uh, Robert Palmer's, uh, over to know the late, great Robert. He Palmer. really was, really was so underrated, so underrated and a big fan of Gary Newman. I have, you know, <laughs> talking of underrated Lawrence, when you look across this conversation that we've had, uh, we've discussed a lot of these questions that are, I think, uh, things that are, you know, skeptical uh, and skeptical people who look at these markets, there are, I think it's fair to say, uh, an underwhelming number of answers for these questions uh, yeah. that you've raised, some of them very good, and some of them really uh, that go right to the core uh, of the cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, uh, and other coin value propositions. So when you think about this, when you look across uh, this, these open questions, what, what conclusions do you reach? And how do you think then uh, about the long-term viability of these markets? Now, again, not suggesting that there are any conclusions here. In fact, just the opposite, just a lot of questions that need to be answered. How does that inform your view of markets as you look at this from the perspective of the global head of markets at Coindesk? So I think when we spoke on the podcast, I said there are early innings. And I think that it still is, it's still the early innings. We don't know what will succeed. We don't know what the future is. This market wasn't even thought of 12 years ago. The yeah. pandemic, other than George uh, W. Bush, no one, no one could conceive that a pandemic of this nature uh, would have happened, right? He was like the only one and look how we treat him. Um, but we, we don't quite know what will be what will reign victorious? We know that um, every day that goes by, it's actually Ethereum is getting more and more um, uh, buy-in. And I think a lot of the great glorious things that we've that we attribute to blockchain technology really 
is like ultimately going to be Ethereum's, um, you know, w- Ethereum specialty, not so much Bitcoin. Um, I think I think Ethereum is underrated in that regard. Uh, pe- people don't like Ether, the cryptocurrency, because it's more likely to uh, have more quantity at some point than Bitcoin is. And also the like, Bitcoiners would add uh, that it has the capacity to be centralized in a way that Bitcoin sure. does not. Yeah, as opposed to Bitcoin, which is mined by a few a handful. Of, but yeah, sure. <sighs> you know, uh, look, and, and I'm not I'm not actually right. You know, this is the thing you're watching this and you're like, oh, he's ragging on. I, on the contrary, on the contrary, I actually do think there are, it has a value. It has it has something. There is a lot going on there. I, I think some of the magic that's ascribed to it is just silly. It's it's just a lot of it's just a lot of wishful, you know, fantasy, right? It, it reminds me of um, years ago. Uh, it was like 2008 during the election. There was a website called it was something like if Obama is elected, and it was just sort of like if Obama's elected, and then you just hit refresh. And it says, if Obama is elected, you know, unicorns will become real. If Obama's, and you refresh again, unicorns, you know, it's like, oh, uh, you know, chocolate, chocolate will flow in our rivers or something, you know, crazy things like that. So it almost becomes kind of a a, a tabula rasa, this blank slate uh, for people to project their hopes uh, of a better future onto. Yeah. Yeah. And instead of like, you know, the reality is we don't know. We don't know. I mean, like, yeah, maybe that could be the case, but maybe no. And that, that's why I was saying earlier, like the world in which it's the only currency around, if it were to take over tomorrow, it would not be a great world. So markets, people have, have an interesting way of, um, they have an interesting way of making, of equalizing it all, of, of making it, uh, of, of giving a reality check to people. So at some point, the value of, of Bitcoin stops growing, right? The market just, it flatlines. It goes as much as it can be. Its adoption grows as much as it can grow. Um, its use cases grow as much as it can grow. And other things, other flavors, different cryptocurrencies pop up. Uh, they have different things going on. Uh, and, and you know, I we poke fun of Doge, and I and I brought it up before, um, but it's not a joke. It actually is not a joke. It's actually one of the things that that people have to pay attention to is the fact that it does have the kind of weird adoption and sort of the the goodwill hmm. that maybe Bitcoin lacks right now. And it's not to say that Doge ends up becoming the currency of the world. No, but it shows how fragile it all really is. Hmm. Because, because the fact that like, you know, Mark Cuban can talk about it on Ellen and then like the Matt and his Mavericks can accept it. Uh, and it's kind of cute and it's funny and people are buying it on Robin hood or whatever. This is as payment for like tickets. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it just shows that people might like the idea of cryptocurrencies and they might not like Bitcoin in the end. Hmm. And I think that really drives the maxis crazy. That it's like, but this is the original one. This is, you know, never mind Elvis. This is Muddy Waters. How come you guys aren't listening to Muddy Waters anymore? That's such an interesting point and food for thought uh, in terms of the potential development for the space. It's obviously something uh, that Bitcoiners would push back against uh, most vigorously. But I'm they curious. should. They should. Let them do it. Let them do it. What do I know? Like I said, I, what do I know? I am an interviewer. I, my job is not to, you know, my job is not to have an, a, a real thought out opinion on all this because I want my mind to be changed. Well, your job is to ask questions, which is what you've done so brilliantly here today, I think, in understanding all of these open issues, uh, trying to 
quantify some of the risks, understand the opportunities, uh, look at the different value propositions. Uh, Lawrence, which brings me to the final question here. With all of this borne in mind, as we look back uh, over all of the questions that you've asked here today, what are your final thoughts, final takeaways uh, that you'd like to leave our subscribers with? So I brought up the, the podcast earlier. And I said this about markets uh, in that podcast as well. Is this that, is the ground floor consensus podcast yeah. that we recorded a few months ago? A nice plug. Um, is that markets are in, in essence a conversation, and they're con they're conversations with people who change their mind all the time while they're having it. Um, you know, think about it with when you own shares, you buy shares and you initially have a thought about where it's going to go, right? You buy a share of uh, a widget company and it trades at a hundred and then it gets up to about 250 and you're really happy, but there are a few things that can happen, right? Your mar your target might've been 150 and it's at 250 now. So now you're, you're updating your projection to a thousand, right? Well, it, it went 2.5x, maybe it'll go a full 10x. I don't know. I'm going to hold on to it. But then it goes back down to 150. And you're like, well, I give up. I'm selling here. Right? You're telling the world, I had a projection for 1,000. I've now cut it back to uh, 150. Right? You've changed your mind. You've expressed it using market me mechanisms. That's kind of what is going on. And that's what will go on for a long while in crypto. You know, not everybody is going to the moon. Not everyone thinks that it goes to the moon. In fact, most people won't. What happens if Bitcoin goes down to 30, 30,000? Which can happen as we talked about liquid markets, right? And you have a few big cells. I don't know how many you would need, but let's say you get a whole bunch of cells and the institutions start rethinking their strategy. A few, uh, a few guys, newly minted MBAs lose their jobs at the banks and hedge funds for, for betting big. And they start liquidating those portfolios and everything happens. Um, and people stop talking about it, which actually is probably Bitcoin's worst nightmare. People stop talking about it. It's like, you know, you know, was, I, I'm ready for my close up now. And there are no cameras, no real cameras anyway. <laughs> and um, it, it, ideas change, minds change. And the conversation isn't, isn't fully formed yet. And people haven't quite found what it will be. I do know that the maxi vision of the world is insane and it's also horrifying in a lot of ways. Um, and it's not, it's not a world that we want to live in, but I also know that the mini version, the view that it goes to nothing is also kind of insane. There's a happy medium between the two. We just don't know where it is yet. There is a value, as I've said, and as you've said, and we've both said today, is that there is a value, there is something, there is some sort of like, you know, getting your money out from one place to another, using it as something, you know, it's maybe not buying coffee, right? Alice isn't buying coffee from Bob at the coffee shop, All right? Alice and Bob, if you read the white paper, those are the two yeah. uh, characters in it. Um, but it's something. And we just don't know what it is. And we also don't know what takes its place yet. We also don't know if there's a better version of that, right? The British pound was the greatest medium of exchange ever. Everything was in pounds. Hundreds of years. For hundreds of years. And then 1914 happens. Mm -hmm. and then 1945 happens. And the world changes. And, you know, we, we didn't expect, you know, where would Bitcoin have been if we didn't have the pandemic? Would this conversation be happening? Would we see 50,000 if, if the Democrats lost Georgia? 
Mm. If President Trump hadn't gone out and said that uh, the election was rigged, everybody stay home or whatever, basically he said. And if like a couple hundred thousand people in Georgia said, you know what, I'm going to vote for the Republicans. What would have happened then? Then there would have been no stimulus the way we see it right now, because right. They, they would look at this and say, all right, you know, we got to be realistic here. Right. Joe Manchin's like the only guy left. You know, Republicans are like making sure he's like walking on pillows, make sure nothing <laughs> happens to him. And 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 uh, Kristen Cinema, they're also like, you know, making sure she's, you know, wearing a helmet when she goes outside, just, you know, in case there's a, you know, God forbid, a slip. Um, but these are all the kind of imponderables uh, that, you know, lead people when they think about this to to say, well, for whatever the path dependency may have been, this is where we are right now. It, yeah. And also, we have to remember that the future is unknown. Right. It's unwritten, as Joe Strummer would say. Um, you know, we, we, we I can't don't think of know. any better place to close it out than on Joe Strummer. I can, but, you know. Johnny Rotten hated them. He hated the clash. I just want to point that out. Talking of things uh, that people uh, like to argue and debate about, uh, the way that markets argue and debate about prices, uh, music and also art, I have to ask, what's the painting behind you? The painting behind me is by my great grand uncle, uh, Landis Lewiton. I now manage his art. This is um, a piece called The Latest. It was painted between 1940, 1954 and 1955. Um, and uh, it was part of a, a bunch of pieces that were at the MoMA as part of a thing called 16 Americans. Back uh, in 1959, 1960, there was an exhibition. Um, he was an influence on the likes of Willem de Kooning. He taught, he, there's some great photos and I have some really fun family photos of him and the Kooning during the painting of Woman One. Um, and uh, so now I take care of his uh, artwork. And um, it's my brother and I, we are, <laughs> you know, just uh, caretaking it uh, for a future generation. Um, he was part of the, um, the New York School, as they call it. He was uh, the founder of the Artist Club. He and Philip uh, Pavia, um, which had many uh, of the great American artists were part of it. And he, he was the founder and the gatekeeper. He was, if you think I'm difficult, he was notorious because the, the artist club had a rule that only uh, you had to get, uh, if you had two no votes into entrance, you couldn't get in. And he was always a no vote. He did not want to grow the size of the artist club. Uh, Apparently so this had, is a genetically uh, predisposition. Uh, it for, is. For your family. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, he, he was very, yeah. I, he was known. For, he was known for being uh, and for getting into arguments uh, hard, with hard artists. to believe. Hard yeah, to believe. I, I think you know. Like I look at you know. It's funny when I read the notes of just some of the stuff that he would tell people. Uh, he told uh, there, there's a famous story. Where Jackson Pollock asked him. Uh, you know, he's like, "Hey, did you see my my newest exhibit?" And he goes, "Yeah, I used to be a good artist. What happened?" It's exactly what you do with crypto. Yeah, but at least he said it to his face. <laughs> nft coming soon oh god um yeah i thought of that actually and i did think of it just just because i thought it'd be fun um but it's uh for the time being i'm just sort of uh my my all my end goal is to actually get all of this stuff um online for as many people to um use for research as possible a worthy goal uh, and one that seems uh, to be uh, a part of the value of this uh, digital asset community that we find ourselves a part of, Lawrence. Yeah, I, you know, I think, I, I think, I don't know what he would have made of, uh, of all this. He either probably would have come up with it. Um, you know, Thomas has called him the the father of, uh, of uh, op art. You know, the because his his whole thing was he included uh, crushed glass. I mean, you can't see it in, in the images, but when you actually see these paintings in person, they sparkle. Mm. They sparkle, and and he was always trying to do new things. And I think I, I I think he probably would have found the NFT thing quite interesting. Probably probably would have 
wanted to be the uh, one of the first people. And then like many of the, the, those type of people would have said, Oh yeah, I did it first. You guys are all posers. <laughs> Talking of sparkle, sparkling conversation, Lawrence. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It was always fun, Ash. Even though I have nothing to add, I, I do appreciate uh, chatting with you. You have lots to add. Zero. Nothing of any value. <laughs> do not listen to anything I've said for the past whatever. Thanks for joining us and thanks for watching, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.